Welcome all across the galaxy to the Recon Center, a Q&A series for Star Wars Imperial Historian. For streamlined sake, I will only be answering no more than two or three questions from each person. However, other questions will be saved and answered for the following Q&A in the future. If I do mispronounce your username, I apologize in advance. First up, we have an anonymous guy who comments, who asks, when am I going to do a face reveal? Captain George also asks, will we ever see the Imperial step out of the shadows at the end of the video? The question there is no, not at this time. I believe myself and the character Arthur Prowse should remain separate. I believe it would take away some of the mystery of the agent of the Empire. However, if I was to ever reveal myself, I would do so in uniform of an Imperial officer. Daniel Tzipron asks, What introduced me to Star Wars? It was at a very young age when I was introduced to Star Wars by my mother, and it was by watching Star Wars on an old VHS videotape. The old VHS copies I was introduced to were from 1994, digitally remastered before any changes from the special editions from the 1997 and the later 2006 DVD version. I distinctly remember being terrified of the trash compactor room with the walls closing in and the groans of the Dianoga, the increasing pace of the pulsing mechanical noise of the compressions of the walls still haunt me to this day. But what fixed me into falling in love with the universe was playing Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 The Sith Lords. It was the first proper RPG I played. Since then, I deeply delved into the mythos of the EU, exploring the Old Republic comics that came out during that time with Zane Carrick. After that, it was the Star Wars Rebellion comic run of following Luke Skywalker, uh, Biggs Darklight Gliter, his friend who joined the Empire and was felt betrayed by Luke and Biggs. After that, it was, of course, the Thrawn trilogy, and then the Bane books and everything else after that. Uh, I just fell in love with the universe. Daniel also asks, how old am I and where am I from? I do my best to keep that kind of information off the internet. I, I don't even use my real name. I hide under the pseudonym of the character Arthur Prowse. However, I shall reveal that I am in my 20s and I am British, living not too far out of London. However, the character Arthur Prowse is 34 by the time of his recordings, before the events of the Battle of Endor in Return of the Jedi. So, by the time of The Last Jedi, he will be 64, the same age as Tarkin, in A New Hope. Captain George asks... What is my favourite bit of music from Star Wars? There are, of course, tons of honourable mentions for several different reasons. Before this video, I took my time to take a look back and uh, my mind kept changing of what I wanted to say in uh, such a short time. The uh, It's Working score is one that uh, springs to mind. It's beautiful. In fact, it's not even that long. It's only about 20 seconds, but that score of the pod races starting and Little Anakin shouting it's working. Yeah, I don't know what the score's actually called, I just know that's the tune what plays in the background. Another favourite soundtrack of mine is the rebuilt Jedi Enclave from Knights of the Republic 2. It's, uh, it plays about two hours before the, end, the actual end of the game. Wonderful moment of looking back of the entire game, the adventure you've had with all the characters you had beforehand and with your mother figure, uh, Kreia, who sits down at the rebuilt temple she sits down and talks about actions which she has taken and actions she's about to do after your meeting with the Jedi Council. Another theme I do like is Thrawn's theme from Rebels. Uh, I'm a sucker for an evil organ score. Similar to how Davy Jones plays the organ in Pirates of the Caribbean 2, it's in that similar vein, but with the organ playing with Thrawn's theme, it's uh, wonderful. It's just goosebumps, and I love using that in my videos, especially when the Empire is doing something evil or if there's a climactic scene I love implementing that score into my videos but my all-time favorite uh, has to be the hologram and binary sunset theme as it's a combination of Leia's theme what strikes a chord in my heartstrings especially now as Carrie Fisher has passed away and the scene of the binary sunset at the beginning is of course evokes emotions of wonderlust a beginning of adventure of better things to come, 
and uh, it's a wonderful piece of music which and is also I think the second most iconic Star Wars theme next to the opening crawl. Uh, Captain George also asks what is my favourite military faction besides the Empire? Captain George, are you from Imperial Security Bureau? Is this a loyalty test? Well, uh, besides the Empire, I've always admired the variety of the Rebel Alliance. I like seeing how different cultures synergize their groups into working together and defeating the overwhelming odds. Also, they have really cool ship designs. I'm a very big fan of, even though it has an obvious weakness, I do like the look and the shape of the Nebulon B frigates and the Hammerhead class Corvette and the CR-90s. I play Star Wars Armada and I own both factions, uh, just to have the Rebellion ships on my shelf. Of course, alongside the superior Imperial fleet with Star Destroyers, Light Imperial Cruisers, Interdictors and Victory class. As Scott Davis asks, what is my favourite Imperial ship? My favourite Imperial ship has to be the Imperial Light Cruiser, the Arquentin, and that is why it's the first video I made. No one else was making a video about it at the time, so I made it. I just like the shape of it. Um, I mean, it's not the Super Star Destroyer, it's not the Eclipse from Legends. It's a basic run-of-the-mill Imperial Starship, which uh, is commonplace around the galaxy at that time, uh, mainly because a Star Destroyer would be overkill for the day-to-day -day Imperial activities. But yes, it's my favourite ship, mainly because I just like the design of a triangle at the front and the cylindrical engines at the back. And of course, it's a continuing design from Clone Wars, and I do love seeing technology being reused and whatnot. I was also very excited to see them in Star Wars Battlefront 2. The Imperial Star Destroyer is a close second, followed by the Interdictor. Legend-wise, I would have to say the Eclipse. Uh, just the scale of it, the monolithic size and the obsidian shadow with the only light being emitted from the Death Star ray miniaturized onto the Eclipse firing upon the capital ships it's uh, that was a good panel of that Star Wars comic I forget what that comic's called I'm pretty sure it's called Dark Times but it might be wrong it's been a while Reese M asks when will I be doing a video on Inferno Squad short answer yes I will be doing a video but it'll be later in the year when the channel timeline shifts past Return of the Jedi and has entered the First Order. Uh, the reason because I won't do a video until then is because at that uh, the time of before Return of the Jedi, Inferno Squad are still a Black Ops team. They are still incognito. They are not widely known across the galaxy. And it would be a bit counterproductive for uh, Arthur Prowse to announce the people in Inferno Squad to the galaxy. And also, I mean... The way I'm going to do it when I become the First Order is that we denounce Inferno Squad because of their betrayal of joining the the, uh, the New Republic and whatnot. That won't be until then, later in the year. Reese Ems also asks, What is the best battle in Imperial history? And what is the most tragic battle in Imperial history? Both canon. Well, the answer to the best battle in Imperial history, I would say, would have to be the Battle of Hoth. It is the most pinnacle point of the Galactic Civil War. It's the point where the Empire strikes back the Rebels after the destruction of the Death Star. It's the, it's the point where the Rebels, after having a base for quite a while, they're just scattered across the galaxy once again. They're disorganised after that. And it takes them about six months to nine months to be reorganised and build their fleet back up. Of course, it doesn't take them that long to regroup and destroy the second Death Star, even though that was supposed to be a trap a bit of a gamble on their part to lose their entire fleet uh, but of course for them it paid off uh, which i would say i've got multiple answers for the most tragic battle for imperial history just continuing the conversation with the previous answer endor is a very tragic battle in the sense that it's the battle where the emperor died it's the battle where most of the fleet was decimated it's the battle where the empire any year's time would not be the powerhouse it was it's it's the beginning of the end. However, I would say the beginning of the end started a lot sooner before that, and that would be at the Battle of Scarif and Yavin, where, of course, they get the plans for Death Star and blow up the Death Star, killing one million Imperial lives on that orbital battle station. But it's also the beginning of the end. Uh, the galaxy sees hope. They can see that they can defeat the Empire, 
and it's also the start of the galactic civil war. But uh, that is not my answer. My answer would be, for the most tragic battle, would be the Battle of Lothal. Technically, it's the end of the war on Lothal. It's a, it's a loose term for the Battle of Lothal, because there were many battles, uh, more skirmishes than anything else. But the last battle on Lothal, when uh, the Spectre Cell and the Lothal Resistance take over the Imperial Complex by enacting Protocol 13, entrapping all of the Imperial personnel onto the complex, thinking that they're safe, to then only be sent up into the air, trapped and murdered in an explosion. For me, that is the most tragic uh, Imperial. That's the most tragic point in Imperial history. Technically, not a battle, but is in the Battle of Lothal. And last, but finally not least, Attila Maniart asks, What is my favourite battle? Well, I keep going back to the Battle of Scarra for shots for Star Wars Imperial Historian, and I love watching it every time. I prefer a battle being played out on a vertical field, how the space fight impacts the ground fight. I would love to have seen, and I thought it was going to happen, when the poster for The Force Awakens came out, that the Starkiller base was going to be this long battle from space, air, to ground, and then into the caves of the base. I've had this wonderful uh, alternate theory where um, Starkiller was going to be the main point of all three movies. There's going to be this build-up to the end. But um, this is how I envisioned the Starkiller uh, battle to, to commence. It was like, of course, you have your space battle, and then they'll eventually invade onto the ground. They can't actually get into the base, and they have that whole battleground. Um, one thing that bothers me about the Starkiller base is that it only has this one weakness, like the Death Star, to blow up. Uh, the idea of this alternate invasion is that it doesn't have weakness. It has self-destruction uh, mechanicalisms, but they're scattered around the entire planet, and they all have to be activated at the same time, much how you would uh, activate a self-destruct with two keys or whatever. In this case, it could be dozens of keys or dozens, dozens of buttons scattered around the planet. And uh, I think that would have been more interesting instead of a more Death Star approach. But I understand why they did that. It was to invoke memories of A New Hope and the original trilogy. And uh, that's how it went out. Book-wise, I would say how the Battle of Jakku is depicted in Empire's End is uh, pretty cool. How the Super Star Destroyer loses its engines and falls into the atmosphere of the planet below, sucking in the ships around it. I, I can just imagine it being on film uh, where... Um, as it's going into the atmosphere, there is just a delay in sound. And then all the noise of explosions and compression of air just causing this disarray. And then hitting the sand of Jakku, creating a shockwave, changing the battlefields of the, of, the, of the dunes of the sand and the tire of the battle at that certain place. It sounds pretty awesome and I would love to see that visually depicted. I know it shows up in the background of Star Wars Battlefront 2005, but it's in the background, and it has no impact. But I would love to see more of Jakku. Thank you for watching the Recon Center, and thank you to everyone who uh, gave out questions. If your question wasn't answered in this video, it will be saved and answered in the following Q&A videos in the future. All in all, I'd like to say thank you very much, and may the Emperor's blessings bestow upon you.